These are, this is my work and play slide. Uh, we'll talk about that on the sidelines. Let's open with some Randall Monroe, XKCD, asking airplane designers about airplane safety. Nothing is ever foolproof, but modern airplanes are incredibly resilient. Flying is the safest way to travel. Asking building engineers about elevator safety. Elevators are protected by multiple tried and tr tested fail-safe mechanisms that are nearly incapable of falling. Asking software engineers about computerized voting. That's terrifying. <laughs> what, really? Don't trust voting software and don't listen to anyone who tells you it's safe. Why? I don't quite know how to put this, but our entire field is bad at what we do, and if you rely on us, everyone will die. <laughs> uh, they say they fixed it with something called blockchain. Ah! Whatever they sold you, don't touch it. Breathe in the desert. Wear gloves. Now, some people have, uh, I think, misunderstood uh, this uh, particular cartoon. There was people writing essays and everything about it. Uh, it's it's actually not a commentary on voting, on software voting or any of that. It's just a commentary on the, like, okay, why do people in the computing field say this? And uh, that's a conversation we can have on the sidelines. There's actually a very good reason. People in the computing field say that kind of thing, but the other, other folks uh, have a lot of confidence. And let's narrow the discussion from voting software, which is broader, to like, sort of a subset, voting machines. And I, think, I, think it's, I think it's fair to say that probably voting machines or maybe not a good idea for high stakes elections and there's, uh, there's a case to be made for paper ballots all the way through. But uh, I can kind of appreciate some of the flip side arguments too. Voting machines uh, can, uh, uh, can tabulate in uh, different ways, like if you wanted to have preference ballot or something. And uh, they can give results very quickly and that can, that can kind of quell unrest when people say, ah, there's our result, we're not, we're not waiting days for it. Uh, all that being said, I think there's nothing really wrong with, with paper ballots. But the idea of, of voting machines interest, interests me from this more theoretical perspective, what I call problems of two or more users having to trust one computer. So let's just use the voting machine area as an example. Uh, how, how do we address the, uh, the fact that there's many stakeholders and one computer that everyone is trusting there. So this is not the only criteria you should apply to such a thing, but this is sort of the, the angle I come at it from. The software that runs on it should be free and open source software. There should be public discussion about what's in it. It should be well known. Uh, scrutineers are people traditionally who come right from the political parties and they'll witness a count or maybe even witness how an election center is run. So I'm putting out there the uh, odd idea that scrutineers could actually witness a software load uh, and all say, hey, okay, we all agree that this, not only is this the s software that was published, but that, that that was what was actually loaded. Uh, because it doesn't matter if you have one thing published and a completely different thing uh, at load time. And I even go so far as to say that they got to stick around uh, while, while the voting machine is in operation. Uh, trusted platform modules are kind of an interesting technical solution for how you can set up a machine and then abandon it. Uh, the issue though in, in elections is if you have like remote attestation that the machine is fine, the machine is fine, oh the machine is not fine, by the time that's happened uh, there's not really any reversing it. Uh, so it's, it's, it's better if you have people watching it to begin with, and TPMs can play a role in that uh, inspection. Look at uh, Trammell Hudson's Heads project or uh, the Lib Libra key for purism. They have this idea of uh, end users watching uh, and validating uh, TPM results early in the boot process before critical software gets loaded. So how do you do the software load? You could go back to what Muzz was talking about yesterday and uh, you could make sure that the build is reproducible. So not only is the software out there for everyone to see, but that it consistently produces the, uh, the same binary when it's, when it's compiled. And, and if it's reproducible, then it's possible to have this idea of give everyone who is a, a witness to the software load the chance to look at a read-only copy of that, of that software. And, how you might do that, maybe you would rely on optical disks that are read-only. Uh, in the world of flash memory, one commonly available combination is that you can get an SD card that has a lock switch and, uh, and an adapter. 
Though I, I think you, many of you are probably already imagining what could possibly uh, go wrong in, in that scenario, right? You know, people are putting optical disks inside their computer. How do they, you know, is that an opportunity for it to be rewritten if it turns out it's actually not a write once optical disk and who can tell the difference? Um, and uh, are there opportunities for sleight of hand if people are moving a, uh, a flash memory card around? That kind of thing. So here's option number two. Uh, have the firmware in your voting machine be uh, just a small bootstrap ROM and give some pe give people a way to uh, verify it, verify that externally before loading additional software with that bootstrap ROM. So maybe lights and switches, and then you can load the process by a bootstrap process. Now, and this isn't a matter of uh, asking the witnesses and the operators to type every bit of software in, you can, you, once you get your bootstrap process far enough along, you can have it load, load data that it will execute and run, and before it actually executes and runs it, just report a cryptographic hash of, okay, I'm about to execute and run this. So maybe the next stage is to actually go from some bootstrap process to running the kernel Linux, and it reports first, hey, there's that, there's that checksum. Uh, and that's the real one for 4.1478. So really interesting going on in the free software world that uh, kind of came out of the reproducible build stuff is uh, the idea of uh, uh, rebuilding the entire world of free software um, and also uh, maybe other uh, platforms as well with uh, having a way to completely uh, have a full bootstrap path that uh, people can use to, um, to uh, bring all of that back. So. One of the main people working on this is Jan from the Netherlands. And you can see, this is uh, from his uh, FOSDEM 2017 uh, talk. You can see that on YouTube or the FOSDEM website. <coughs> what he's working on is uh, the GNU MESS project. And MESS is, Ma he calls it Maxwell's Equations for Software. Really funky. And it is mutually self-hosting. Uh, which is a little different from the idea of, say, uh, of a self-hosting compiler. Like, the, you know, the example of, uh, like, most C compilers are themselves written in C and they can compile themselves and that's just self-hosting. So here's the example of how this is mutually self-hosting. They have a scheme interpreter. Scheme is a popular Lisp variant. The scheme interpreter is written in C. And scheme is, of course, a good language for writing uh, a or pardon me, C is a good language for writing a portable interpreter that you want to that you want to bootstrap because of the portability of it. And then they have MESS CC. It's a C compiler written in Scheme. So both of these can interpret or compile each other. And um, Scheme is a good language for writing a language compiler. And so they've gotten to the point now where it can build. Uh, a C compiler called TCC, uh, which was originally written for the International C Ops uh contest, but it's now in a very, it's not obfuscated anymore, and it, people, uh, people use it for different things. And TCC can build the GNU triplet uh, from which the rest of the free world can be, can be fully, fully built. So there's the GNU compiler collection, there's the GNU C library, and there's GNU bin utils, which is like stuff for linking and, uh, and dealing with assembler and stuff. So working more on the low level, we have uh, Jeremiah Orions, uh, who appears to be from the United States. I don't have a picture of him, but this is a GitHub uh, Gravatar. Uh, and if you can't read that at the back, it, his gravatar says the first th version of everything is janky. Don't fear jankiness. And uh, the way that he's, he's starting out the bootstrap is they've defined a virtual machine infrastructure that they call Knight. That's not their logo. And then they have a very simple ROM that is a monitor. So the idea of a, a monitor in um, when you're doing this kind of thing is a monitor is a program that lets you uh, inspect and uh, insert uh, data into particular memory addresses and to jump and execute. So this is actually the uh, Apple II monitor that I grabbed a screenshot from. <laughs> Very good. Um, and then uh, they call it the Stage Zero project, but they actually have Stage Zero and Stage One and Stage Two all in that. Um, so then they have uh, hex assemblers of increasing uh, complexity. So that's, instead of you entering manually, you actually have hexadecimal and a text file. Um, 
So you can put, have, uh, it's a machine language level, but you can put comments and stuff in it. And then they have, uh, they, from that they build macro assemblers uh, where you can define uh, macros to, uh, instead of having hexadecimal, you can start uh, having uh, more human uh, readable versions of, uh, of things. And uh, that stuff's coming really well along. They, um, they, so they've been work, bringing their two projects together. The scheme interpreter written in C that Jan from the Netherlands wrote, it can output, um, it can, uh, the mess and messy, they can have their output in the M1 macro assembler language. And so thanks to that now, the, the free world can now be rebootstrapped uh, with only a one megabyte blob. They actually kind of call it readable because I think they have comments around their, um, uh, their macro assembler that, that's outputting. Um, I'm not sure how readable that really is. But um, it, one megabyte is uh, a lot smaller of a blob than what they, they used to rely on, which was a, a full binary build of the GNU triplet, uh, GNU compiler collection, GNU C library, binutils, and that was hundreds of megabytes. And they're working to get, it, get things down to even smaller. Uh, they have, uh, they're working on a C compiler uh, that's uh, not the full C language, but is a much smaller subset that's called the M2 planet. And they're rewriting the, uh, the scheme interpreter that was written in C uh, to use the simpler C variant. And uh, so that will mean that uh, mostly you'll have to, uh, if you're trying to read this stuff to uh, inspect your bootstrap, you'll have to, most, most of the reading you'll have to do before you get to uh, more well-known software is the, um, that would be the, uh, the, the scheme interpreter written in, written in a simple C variant. You'd have to read that instead of a bunch of assembler. Now, a lot of people have said, well, what about fourth? And I had the exact same thought. And they've, they've heard it from a lot of people because wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice if you can bootstrap fourth as early as possible in the process and not have to deal with so many hex levels of hex assemblers and macro assemblers, you know, and maybe you can write your, your scheme interpreter in fourth or even go so far as to write your... Um, your, your C compiler in fourth. Uh, but, you know, suggestions does not make working code make, and they've kind of thrown down the gauntlet and said, because a great many people started, stated fourth would be an ideal bootstrapping language, and so the time and effort was put forth, uh, they have a little bit of it there for people to kind of build upon. But it's ultimately determined from their perspective that assembly was preferable as the underlying architecture wasn't total garbage. It now sits waiting for any fourth programmer who wishes to prove fourth is a real bootstrapping language. So here are some image macros about throwing down the gauntlet. Because it's Sunday morning. And here are, uh, I, I like the idea of fourth because there are uh, now obsolete, but you know, still somewhat available computers that were manufactured that actually had, were self-programmable with fourth firmwares. Uh, so there's some of those examples. Um, and then uh, that's uh, most of what I have to say today. I've just got some other ideas out here for sideline talk. I'm just putting them in the slides so people can look at them. Uh, so I'm not going to waste uh, presentation time on that. I'm just running it past. Uh, I can give a quick summary though. Right Andreessen I talked about last year. And um, uh, oracles as, a, as data feeds. Uh, People are using uh, an Intel technology for that, but maybe bootstrapping is kind of an alternative. And uh, is there, does bootstrapping me with a bunch of witnesses, does that give a way to make a shared tenancy hosting co-op? That's an interesting question. So where are we on time? We are at 20 after, we're doing great. I'll take your questions. I got five. Shop. The skill level doesn't need to be high because the uh, once once you get to the point where a bootstrapping system can report uh, report stuff on a screen, they just need to see in a book that it matches that. Like, oh, this is the checksum I'm expecting. When you get far enough, you can even start displaying QR codes on screen, and people can have come come as witnesses to a software loading with their smartphones and just say, 
okay, I saw that the earlier part of the process was done right now. I just I hold up my smartphone, and the smartphone will tell me uh, if the wrong QR code shows up on screen. Uh, well, not when we're talking in person. Then we're talking about like having uh, an, uh, a localized display technology, like like say an analog monitor, on an already bootstrapped computer. But yeah, it, sure. The 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 hard, tampering at the hardware level is is always sort of a risk with these things, of course. Uh, and so, if you really want to go far with it, you know, there's ways to build more inspectable hardware uh, as well. I actually bought something very interesting also from the Netherlands. Uh, a group of people uh, put together um, an interesting CPU uh, with, um, with TTL logic chips uh, that actually fits on one board because they optimized it to use a lot of software techniques instead of hardware techniques. And so it's a TTL computer on one board. Uh, so that's, uh, that's amazingly inspectable. And even going further on inspectability, uh, there's some people who have a project who've built a MOS 6502 uh, on one very big circuit board. And so there, there is some room for verifiability there. The display tech, that's, a very, uh, that's another interesting realm uh, to look into. Uh, mechanical TTYs as a t display tech might be, might be your out. Let's leave it at that. I'll see y'all. <laughs>